Good day unsuspecting YouTuber. Today I have some good news and some even better news for you. The good news is that this video will contain references to and examples of some hardcore mathematical and statistical concepts. The even better news is that they're all there to tell a story about what we did successfully to keep improving on the accuracy of our model for explaining the variability in real world IBM share prices. So, if you're looking for a place where all those hours you've spent understanding the ideas and maths behind statistical concepts comes in handy, I'm convinced you'll appreciate the beauty of the contributions we've made. However, if you've had more of a social life up to now and are not necessarily as dialed into the formulas, the visual representations also paint an interesting practical story that will allow you to understand the ideas without the need for looking up the mathematical detail. We'll start off by introducing the empirical environment we are trying to model, namely real-world share price returns and volatility. This will enable us to constantly link the statistical notions with their practical meaning and application in the real financial world. We will then present the classic gauge model for daily returns, which will enable us to start from a well-known base and add on our enhancements step by step. Next, we will introduce the goodness of fit tests used to compare the performance of different models. We will then consider the practical meaning of some of the theoretical groundwork of stochastic processes based on inverse Gaussian distributions. The next step is to start adding enhancements to better model our empirical environment and consider the results. The first enhancement will be the addition of non-Gaussian or non-normal innovations. To cater for the generally accepted notion that heavier tails are often encountered in financial returns, we extend the normal gauge model by assuming innovations are normal inverse Gaussian distributed, which can be interpreted as a normal innovation coupled with a multiplicative random impact factor adjustment of the ordinary gauge volatility. We relate this new volatility estimate to realized volatility and suggest that the random impact factors are due to news noise processes influencing the underlying returns process. Since we expect information gain when using more data, we also cater for high, low and close data as well as full intraday data instead of only daily returns. This is achieved by introducing the Brownian inverse Gaussian process, which follows naturally from the unit inverse Gaussian distribution and Brownian motion. This is a hybrid between traditional gauge models and stochastic volatility models. However, we do encounter one problematic result. There is empirical evidence of time dependence in the random impact factors. This means that the news noise processes, assumed to be independent, are indeed time dependent, as can be expected. Thus, we extend the model still further by allowing for autocorrelation in the random impact factors. The increase in complexity necessitates the use of simulated maximum likelihood methods in conjunction with efficient importance sampling and the control variate variance reduction techniques for obtaining an approximation to the likelihood function and parameter estimates. Fitting these models to generated and empirical IBM share price data, we find that the accuracy of the model fit increases as we move from models assuming normally distributed innovations and allowing for only daily data to those assuming time-dependent underlying Brownian inverse Gaussian processes and allowing for full intraday data. After what will seem like only a handful of minutes of fun, we will end off with concluding remarks. We obtained a few years worth of real-world IBM share price data and will present the results of applying the models to increasingly shorter time periods, starting with daily returns and ending with 5-minute interval data. We will now consider the most relevant stylized facts of financial returns data, which will guide our modeling process. To ensure stationarity in the time series, we follow the common practice of working with first differences of log prices, commonly known as log returns. As we'll see in the following slide in just a moment, while the price series itself is not stationary, the log returns series appears much more stationary. Now for the most influential factor. The concept of volatility is probably the most researched phenomenon in financial markets. The root of the word literally means to fly, and volatile is defined as easily evaporated at normal temperature. Investments that easily evaporate under normal conditions can lead to investors with as it were, very volatile moods. 
So, asset price volatility is a measure of the uncertainty, randomness or risk in the behavior of the asset price, and we want to model it accurately. Looking at the log return series, we see periods of higher volatility and periods of lower volatility. This is known as volatility clustering, which implicates that volatility shocks today are likely to influence volatility in the future. Since we will be considering lots of distributions shortly, just a quick link between actual asset price returns and distributions. This graph displays the normal distribution, which is our starting point, with an empirical return distribution overlaid. What seem to happen in financial data more often than the normal distribution caters for are small and big changes as opposed to mid-sized changes. So we're looking for a distribution that adds some weight to the peak and the tails while taking that weight from the part in between where the mid-sized changes are. We also need to cater for non-symmetric return distributions as gains and losses are not necessarily balanced. We will now consider arch models and their descendants for modeling these asset price returns and work our way towards such distributions. Serious study into the issue of modeling financial volatility got underway when Professor Robert Engel introduced the autoregressive conditional heteroskedasticity model in 1982. This seminal paper triggered one of the most active and fruitful areas of research in econometrics over the past four decades. In gauge models, the daily log returns can be expressed in terms of an expected or structural component and a volatility component multiplied by an innovation assumed to have zero expectation and unit variance. Linking this back to our share prices, the structural component and volatility is assumed to be at most dependent on past share prices. We will use the popular AR1 gauge 11 model given on this slide. This choice has been shown to work well in most cases. As our base model, we will use the well-known configuration where the innovations are assumed to be normally distributed with mean beta and unit variance. We indicate this by DNOR since it utilizes daily log returns and assumes normally distributed innovations. Before we introduce the enhancements, a word on the tests we'll utilize to check the goodness of fit. The Durbin-Watson statistic will be used to check for first order autocorrelation, while the Q and Lagrange multiplier tests will indicate whether there are any remaining gauge effects to be catered for. Probabilities in the order of 5% or less indicate remaining effects. As an example, we see that the daily normal model fitted to data generated by the same process fits well, as expected. A quantile-quantile plot is basically a scatter plot of the quantiles of an empirical dataset against the quantiles of its implied distribution. This will indicate the reasonability of the assumptions on the innovations, with a perfectly straight 45 degree line indicating a perfect fit. Again, we see that the innovations from the daily normal model fit the generated daily normal data quite well, as expected. A probability integral transform plot is closely related to a QQ plot, but plots the cumulative distribution against the implied uniform cumulative distribution. Again, the assumption fits the data generated by the assumption quite well. However, we will only show the QQ plots here. We will now scan through a bit of the theory, but I will not focus on the formula except we're pointing out some special cases. We will rather focus on how it adds to our story and what it means in practice as we move through the distributions. The generalized inverse Gaussian distribution was proposed in 1953 and has since been used for many purposes. Following others, we will choose to work with an alternative parameterization, as given here. Note that delta times gamma is a location parameter, and delta over gamma is a scale parameter. We then start moving to special cases. Firstly, fixing lambda at minus a half leads to the inverse Gaussian distribution. And secondly, setting delta equal to gamma equal to psi gives us the unit inverse Gaussian distribution which we are particularly interested in. This graph illustrates the possible shapes of the UIG distribution. The higher Psi is, the closer the distribution is to a degenerate distribution with all its probability at 1. It is clear that the unit inverse Gaussian distribution is a candidate for modeling the higher peaks and heavier tails experienced in financial returns. Using the mean variance mixture technique, we now create X as a mean variance mixture of the normal distribution with a UIG as the mixing distribution. 
x then has what we call the standard normal inverse Gaussian distribution, and the values of beta and psi determine the location, scale, skewness and kurtosis. This graph shows how positive beta skews the distribution to the right, while smaller psi causes higher peaks and heavier tails. We see that it is now possible to adjust the distribution, leading to a leptokurtic distribution, to better model the asset price returns with. However, we have not yet added much to improve our modeling of the volatility. We still have only the volatility component of the classic gauge model, which we will shortly show to be only a smoothed version of the actual or realized volatility experienced. In order to model the returns and realized volatility simultaneously, we need a bivariate distribution, which we will now introduce. With W being UIG as before, introduce a new chi-squared variable C. The distribution of V equal to W times C is then what we call the standard chi-squared inverse Gaussian distribution. This graph shows how the parameters affect the shape of the distribution, changing the weight in the tails and the peaks. Note how, like volatility, V can only be positive. Finally, we obtain our bivariate distribution by combining the two inverse Gaussian distributions. Just to pull everything together, recall that Z is standard normal, W is UIG, and C is chi-squared distributed. Then, we have seen that X is standard normal inverse Gaussian, and V is standard chi-squared inverse Gaussian. Now, the joint distribution of X and V is what we call the standard normal chi-squared inverse Gaussian distribution, and we require it to simultaneously estimate the model parameters for observed values of the share price return and volatility. Let's look at this distribution graphically. When we compare the top right graph with the other three, where only one parameter is changed each time, we see the following. Beta moves the distribution along the x-axis, while larger values for the other two parameters cause the distribution to shift along the v-axis and reduce the peakedness, causing it to be more spread out. As expected, this combines the parameter impacts we have seen on the two univariate distributions into one. Of course, there are a lot of very interesting properties, special cases and derivations which we haven't touched on here, that would require a lot of time, not to mention strong locks on the doors to keep you in. If you are interested in any of these, I'll gladly provide you with more detail, as well as the number of a good support group to help you get back into some social circles. For now, let's take what we have and expand the standard Brownian motion process to include some non-normal innovation processes. When we add constant drift and constant volatility to a standard Brownian motion, we get the well-known Wiener process. However, when we add time steps to our standard normal inverse Gaussian process, we get a process with stochastic drift and stochastic volatility, as introduced by the UIG distributed W. Adding translation and scale parameters to generalize leads us to the Brownian inverse Gaussian process, which is the basis of our new model. This slide shows the difference between standard Brownian motion and the Brownian inverse Gaussian process without scale or translation effects. The simulated Brownian motion paths tend to go upwards since the drift set to 1 is positive. Next, we draw 10 random observations from a unit inverse Gaussian distribution with psi equal to 1 and compare the corresponding Brownian inverse Gaussian processes with the Brownian motion paths. It is clear that, for W larger than 1, the drift and volatility is enhanced, leading to bigger steps or in terms of distributions, more weight in the tails. This equates to larger than normal share price movements. For W smaller than 0, the steps are diminished, which corresponds to a distribution with a higher peak. Finally, let's see how model performance improves as we add enhancements. We begin by fitting the normal gauge model to the daily returns. Following in the footsteps of the theory we just went through, we enhance the D-NOR model in two ways. Firstly, we allow for non-normal, or more specifically, normal inverse Gaussian innovations. Then we add intraday time steps by increasing the number of observations taken per day. We first fitted all the models to generate the data. This was basically a test for accuracy of logic and coding. And in the end, the models fit their corresponding generated data well. Also, the normal distributed based models did not fit the Brownian inverse Gaussian process data that well, as can be seen in this example, where the Brownian motion model does not estimate the realized volatility accurately. But the more interesting results and the real tests 
are the fits to real-world IBM data. This slide contains the results with parameters moving down and different model fits indicated in the headers. We can make some interesting observations from the results given here. Firstly, taking standard errors into account, the AR gauge parameter estimates of the daily and high-low close normal models agree well with their inverse Gaussian counterparts. This is in line with the consistency property of quasi-maximum likelihood. However, the standard errors become significantly smaller as we moved to the normal inverse Gaussian based models and intraday data. For instance, the standard error for beta reduces from a very large 0.5 for the daily normal model to 0.19 for the daily normal inverse Gaussian model to 0.05 for the 5 minute intraday Brownian inverse Gaussian model. So the parameter estimates get more accurate the more enhancements we add on. Next, the estimates for the normal inverse Gaussian parameters beta and psi indicate that they are indeed required, so that we would expect these fits to be better than the normal fits. Also, the estimate for beta is negative, which indicates that negative news shocks have a more pronounced impact on volatility than positive news events. This is in line with other results and also makes intuitive practical sense. Let's look at the goodness of fit in terms of quantile-quantile plots. This graph shows that the daily normal and high-low close normal models fit reasonably well, as we have seen in the previous slide. However, there is some deviation which can be improved upon. Here we see how bringing the normal inverse Gaussian distribution into the daily model leads to a better fit. All lines are closer to the 45 degree benchmark, especially in the tails. The same holds for the high-low close model with underlying Brownian inverse Gaussian process instead of Brownian motion. Turning to the Brownian motion model for the 5 minute intraday data, it is interesting to note that the fit for Z is better than it had been for the daily and high-low close models given a few slides back. This indicates the information gain as we use more of the available data. However, we see that the assumptions on the volatility are still not accurate. But adding the Brownian inverse Gaussian process to the mix, we are able to accurately describe the volatility component as well. As shown on this graph. In addition, the quantile quantile plots show that the assumptions on the other variables are also reasonable for the Brownian inverse Gaussian model fit to the intraday data. Let's take a quick look at the estimation of the realized volatility, shown in red on this graph. Also shown are two estimates of the volatility. Firstly, the green line is the gauge estimate, which we see is only a smooth version of the realized volatility. The blue line shows that the daily normal inverse Gaussian model adjusts the gauge estimate slightly, but it's still not close to the actual volatility. This is expected since intraday data has not yet been used. Bringing the intraday data into the model, we see that W adjusts H to such an extent that it overlaps almost perfectly with the realized volatility. So the normal inverse Gaussian innovations with intraday data allows us to describe the volatility much better than before. However, there is still one problem with our model fit. Looking at the Durbin-Watson test, we see that there is autocorrelation present in W, V and C. This goes against our current model assumptions of independence over time. Examining the autocorrelation, we see the following. Firstly, the autocorrelation parameter is significantly different from zero, as expected. Secondly, allowing for first order or AR1 autocorrelation is sufficient in this case, since the tests do not indicate any remaining effects. Adding this autocorrelation assumption to the Ws makes it much more difficult to estimate the likelihood function, since a suitable multivariate inverse Gaussian distribution does not seem to exist. We therefore employ efficient importance sampling to transform normally distributed variables with first order autocorrelation into the required inverse Gaussian variables. To this we add the control variate variance reduction technique. We use the relationship between the efficient importance sampling estimate when rho equals zero and the normal maximum likelihood estimate excluding time dependence to reduce the volatility of the estimate when rho does not equal zero. In this way we achieve an almost 20-fold reduction in the variance of the estimates. Fitting this model, we confirm that the autocorrelation is indeed present in the IBM data, as the estimate is significantly different from zero. 
Also, we see some changes in the other estimates as a result of adding the time dependence. Especially alpha 1, beta 1 and rho are severely biased by the dependence in W. Looking at the quantile quantile plots on the next two slides, we see that the assumptions on the variables are still reasonable, as before. Finally, we consider the tests for remaining effects. When using only 30 minute intraday intervals, we see that no remaining effects are indicated. This means the assumptions on all our variables seem to hold, and we are able to describe the real world IBM share prices a lot more accurately than allowing only for normally distributed innovations and using only daily returns. However, when we move to 5 minute intraday data, we see two small issues. The first one is some autocorrelation indicated in V and C. But since no autocorrelation is indicated in the Ws, this is not a crucial point. Of more importance is the evidence of remaining arch effects in the Ws. Of course, we could increase the complexity of our gauge specifications. It should also be noted that this could be due to well-known microstructure effects when working with high-frequency data. But that's it for now. There are a lot of interesting results we haven't considered here, and some potentially interesting topics for further study have also been identified, but that will have to stand over for now. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions or would like any further information, let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to answer.